can see economics is of some interest in the news. I think for this class, which has to do with things nuclear and nuclear policy, there are a couple of other reasons to bother with economics. Just to make clear, we're going to talk about that first. Then, what are the basics of electrical production, consumption, distribution, and storage needed to assess the costs of different electrical options? And then, how do nuclear and non-nuclear systems or forms of energy perform economically at home and abroad? Let's go back to that first question, though, why it matters. Um, you can tell countries are spending you know, billions of dollars, hundreds of billions, maybe even trillions, on energy resources and equipment and technology for a variety of purposes. A big chunk of that's for electricity. Um, so if you want to basically judge a government, you might want to see how they're doing and making those calls. So international relations, you want to rate countries and their competence, how well they handled this economic arena is not a bad place to kind of get a metric. Um, I think uh, with regard to nuclear restraint, though, the, the point of interest is this. Um, we know from our previous lectures that civilian nuclear technology particularly if you get into enrichment and reprocessing, can bring you very, very close to bomb making. The way we look at civil nuclear technology materials, however, is that they're all legitimate as long as they can be claimed to be peaceful under the NPT, and that, in fact, you have an inalienable right to produce, research, and uh, acquire these technologies and materials, as so long as, without discrimination, so long as they have some conceivable civilian application, they're declared and occasionally inspected. However, in the real world, it kind of matters. You know, people don't go running around declaring inalienable rights all the time. Uh, although, you know, perhaps within the belt where we're not as aware of this, since actually around here, people kind of do do that. You know. Maybe too much. But if you get away from the beltway, people are a little more normal. You generally only insist on rights that you want to exercise because they're beneficial. And even the NPT talks about sharing the benefits of civilian nuclear energy. Now, if there are no benefits to a particular activity, chances are people are not going to be insisting on their right to it so much. And let me give you an example. I think I did earlier in the class. Remember that whole question of Article 5, which uh, shares the potential benefits of peaceful nuclear explosives? Well, nobody ever asked for it, because when they did the math, by the time you finish cleaning up the mess, you lose money. So it's a terrible way to do civil construction. So nobody ever asked for it. Not only that, but as I pointed out, when you go to the review conference description of how to think about Article 5 in the 2010 review conference document, they say, see UN resolution blah, blah, blah. Well, that's a UN resolution banning nuclear tests. It's especially important to focus on the economics of not only nuclear activities, but particularly the nuclear activities that bring you closest to getting the bomb. If they are particularly uneconomic and they, are, they bring you within a wink and a nod of a bomb, and, and you, because they're so close to that, they can't really be safeguarded with timely warning, there are a lot of reasons that you might not have an inalienable right or want to exercise it, and why you might as a country that wants to prevent proliferation, point this out. We do not remember, perhaps, but there were people arguing that Iran shouldn't build Bushir. Why? Well, it didn't make any economic sense. They must be doing it for another reason. So this is not theoretical. You know? 
might be useful to know what's economic. I know that if you can prove something is not economic and that you can't safeguard it, you end up trying to restrict it a lot more. I, I don't think we can understand the Iran nuclear deal and how bearish it is about reprocessing and enrichment without understanding those points. And in fact, say what you will about that deal, whether you're for or against it, it does bear down on those things. Well, that's no accident. OK. Um, let's get into it. Well, you, you can't just get into costing things. You know why? You don't know what the things are. First, you've got to understand some of the basic components of the system to understand how to cost it. So let's get into it. Now, this is a cartoon. I think you can recognize your house. Uh, you could probably recognize uh, Homer Simpson's power plant because there's a cooling tower. And you could probably understand the wires. Uh, you've probably seen these big towers and cleared out areas. Some of you, have, you know, might live next to a little transformer system. Uh, and you've definitely seen wires on poles and little transformer drums right before your house. Okay. Well, let's go through what, what is this all about. The power plant uh, comes in a lot of different flavors, but the dominant kind of power plant is one that produces heat through nuclear energy, fossil fuels, that'd be natural gas, or coal, could do oil, that's very rare now. Um, that heat is used to boil water. It produces steam. It spins a turbine. The turbine generates electricity because it's got magnets. And the, it produces an electrical voltage on a frequency equivalent to how many revolutions per minute that thing spins. And you get different ratings. Hertz is basically a frequency that's geared to the spin rate of that turbine. That voltage then goes out over uh, high voltage transmission lines. Now, we'll get into it. The dominant kind of uh, voltage uh, is alternating current. And um, I guess the best way to understand alternating current is instead of, imagine I'm an electron, my thumb's an electron, going down a wire towards its objective. You have the thumb go back and forth, and it moves everything else. Everything else is moving at a certain jitter rate. That energy, that ele electric energy, can be tapped. Even though the electron doesn't go to its destination, everything is moving back and forth, and that can be tapped. Alternating current, back and forth. Okay. We'll get back to that in a moment. But be with alternating current, you can you will lose some, some electricity over the line, a certain percentage. Uh, but they have something called transformers that can up the voltage. And we'll explain how that works. Then you put it on uh, uh, you know, a local distribution system instead of a bulk. You know, the first part to the transformer, I think, is called a bulk distribution system. The local system, which is what we're most familiar with, uh, because we see the squirrels and the birds sitting on the, the wires. And, yeah. uh, it actually has a transformer that reduces the amount of uh, voltage. Now, um, how many of you used a hairdryer this morning? <laughs> These are Canadians. Anybody else? Nobody else. How many of you have ever used an electric space heater? Use it in the winter, right? How many of you use, uh, <coughs> I'm trying to think of two, uh, a, a, uh, a crock pot, heating element, okay? Uh, or an air conditioning system? All of you have, right? These things use a lot of electricity. Have you ever experienced having all of these things on at the same time, and then all of a sudden, 
to your electricity in your house. Stop it. Anything? It's called blowing a fuse. Any, any, of, you, any of you have not experienced that? You've never had a fuse blow in your life? Get a hair dryer. <laughs> Why is that? It's because, and we'll get into this, if you draw more electricity than is being supplied, you blow a fuse. You, the, the, the grid, if you will, even in your small area, is out of balance. Similarly, if any of you ever been in, in an electrical storm where there's been lightning and the lightning has knocked out your electricity, any of you? Yeah, that's called a surge, and if you get more electricity coming into the house than you use, boom, blows the fuses or the transformers or the trip, trip uh, systems. And you cannot function until those things are fixed. In some cases, they have to replace the transformer, which is a big project. More likely, you wait a couple hours, and you go down and you try flipping your switches and your stuff comes back on. All right, so the point I'm trying to get at is, I think I mentioned it in the lecture, did, did anyone read the lecture? Is there a single person here that looked at the lecture? Yes, good. These two matter, I, I always, they're, they're special. The rest of you might take a look at it occasionally. Uh, I just rewrote it, or edited it this morning. Uh, it'll be posted soon. One of the things I ask is, and, and the two here should not answer because they know the answer. What, it, look, it, there's an electrical plug here somewhere, isn't there? I don't know. Uh, there's one right there. We pay a bill every month for what comes out of that, that plug. How much of that bill uh, is due or paid for the cost of generating electricity here? Anybody know? I mean, that's the biggest part of the thing, but you know, it's really physically the biggest part. And arguably, for physical plants, it's the, by far the most expensive. So what do you think the cost percentage is attributable to that guy? Anybody know? By the way, get it wrong, please. That's the same. Say what? 10 percent. A little under Ten percent. It's fine. Any, do I have any other bids? Higher, lower? Half of one cent. No, 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 no percentage, please. We have ten and fifty. Any, any other numbers? Probably about seventy percent. Seventy percent. I like you. You remind me of almost everyone here with election certificates. <laughs> that means you're dead wrong. This is how most people politically think about electricity. It must be the most expensive. Two-thirds of the cost has to do with the management of the system to make sure you don't get too much, you don't get too little. Goldilocks formula has to actually happen. So what you're paying for is the management of this system to make sure not too much and not too little gets to the factory or the home. Everything else has out of phase, including so when you want, when you have a, a crisis and there's a blackout, there's always this thing. Well, we need to have more generators. Um, yeah. No, it's more complicated. That may not be the way to solve it. Okay. So uh, there are other ways to generate electricity. I should mention uh, windmills. They have a frequency that they go round and round. And then photovoltaic, which is different. Uh, there also, it isn't represented here, but at many plants now, natural gas plants in particular, they're toying with having battery storage. And the reason why I will get into in a moment is some plants are baseload and some plants are peak load. We'll get into that. All right, so let's go back here and just explain the dominant you know, way we uh, convey electricity, and that is alternating current. And in this case, instead of all of the electrons, this is direct current, going in one direction, moving like a stream, 
this is more like uh, trying to think what the analogy would be. Um, well, a seesaw, I guess. Back and forth. Okay. Now, why does why do we have these two systems? Oh, one other thing. Uh, you lose some energy uh, in both of these things over the wires. You know, it's a surface current. With alternating current, they came up with this little invention. It turns out they discovered that if you uh, have like six windings at one end, you know, you have that wire coming in and you wind it around a, uh, this is a iron core, and then you have 12 on the outside. The, the magnetic uh, and, and electrical forces come out here twice as great as, as they come in. So you can, you can kind of like keep boosting the current with these transformers. It was a nifty idea. Um, Tulsa, does anybody remember who he was? You know, the car, the Tulsa car? Well, it's a guy. He came up with that. Tesla. I, I mispronounced it. So why do we have these two systems, though? It's kind of historical. Edison was a big fan of direct current. There, there's some terrific uh, national public television Sloan uh, Foundation movies on this uh, that, that are kind of fun. Chip Edison, Westinghouse, the real people, uh, Tesla. He wanted to have direct current as the basis for electrical um, power systems in the US. And what he did is he tried to put up local systems because he couldn't get the direct current to go very far before it, it lost its energy level. It also at the time was very expensive to deal with direct current because almost all appliances operate off of alternating current. So you had to convert the direct current into alternating current. And they knew how to do it, but it was really expensive. That's when the alternating current in the Westinghouse alternatives. What, what did Westinghouse do? What is, I mean, this is almost like Tea Party communism here. You, you rip off <laughs> the patent and you, and you put money into it and you make lots more money. And uh, Tesla's uh, life uh, was one of some misery because he, he sold out too cheap. Uh, Westinghouse came and uh, the rest literally is history. With alternating current and the um, transformers, you did not have to do the transformation from direct current to alternating current. It was alternating current from the start. Also, you could move quite a distance with the transformer. Up until recently, the alternating current model has been super dominant for those reasons. However, direct current's making a comeback. Uh, slowly but surely. And the reason why is the loss of electricity over distance no longer is a big deal. It doesn't happen so much. Uh, they, they have ways of reducing the loss of voltage over distance on wires. Second of all, converting direct current into alternating current is a lot cheaper now because of microcircuitry and the advances in computing technology. So one of the advantages of direct current uh, is you don't have transformers that can fail. I mean, they can be an issue. Like I said, they get hit with lightning, you know, can ruin your entire afternoon. And they're hard to replace. They're pretty big, and they don't make many of them. They don't just take off the shelf and plug and play. Beyond that, uh, direct current is very efficient for moving vast amounts of electricity that are in surplus. It's pretty good if you have an enormous solar or wind field or a lot of hydro. So interconnectors uh, increasingly are um, direct current in Europe. And you can see these lines here, 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 here. They're on the mark. It, it, it's not you know, right around the corner, but these things are not dying. They're getting longer, bigger, and there are more of them. OK. Now, 
you could you could perhaps wonder, well, you know, back up just a little here. Um, I want to make sure there's some continuity here. All righty. Let's see here. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is an awkward transition. I knew I needed to go look at this. <laughs> Just as there are different kinds of current, direct current, alternating current, and different kinds of transmission systems, We'll get into it, but there are different frequencies. In some countries, the frequency is uh, 50 megahertz, and some others it's 60. How many of you travel with plugs that, yeah, well, that's long. They're operating at different frequencies. Okay. You, know, you don't want to blow up your appliance. You take a converter. So there are different uh, frequencies. Like all that, there are different power systems. Some are fired by oil, natural gas, propane, diesel. Others are powered by nuclear energy, hydropower, wind, and solar. Now, you could ask, well, why do we need all that? And why is all that going? Now, one answer is, oh, well, you know, somebody is subsidizing something, and they're just, you know, doing this because, well, they talk to some senator or some state representative. But that's not quite right at all. The reason why that's not quite right is most of the uh, electrical systems United States is what's called an emergent system. Not all of them. Uh, does anybody know what that refers to, an emergent system versus a regulator system? Well, you know, when you pay your bills, you, you might want to know what the difference is. You live in, I believe, a merchant zone. And the merchant zone means that the utilities have to make a business case to a bank or an investor to do the capital improvements uh, that they do. In other, in other words, they have to justify the financing and get it from private sources. They then take that to a regulator and say, look, you know, we want to do X. We have persuaded these folks to finance it. Will you approve it? In a regulated system, the utility, this is mostly in the South, you simply go uh, as a utility uh, owner and you tell your regulator, uh, I'd like to charge the ratepayers more because I want to build X. If you want to understand why there was a political crisis, is there anybody here from uh, South Carolina? Nobody? Anybody from Georgia? What's going on there with nuclear power? What do you think? What's going on? What's the big story there? Big story being with the Savannah River plant? Okay, you got to look at your local news. Do you, you still vote down there? No, I moved to Maryland. Yeah, well, that's the reason. If you were paying your utility bill, you'd know what I'm talking about. They're building the world's most expensive nuclear plant in the history of man. You know who's paying for that? My parents. No, no you, you too. They got a loan guarantee, federal loan guarantee. It's going to cost 28 to 30 billion dollars to build 2.4 <coughs> gigs. That's about 14 to 15 thousand dollars for installed kilowatts. Per kilowatt. Yeah. That's really expensive. Um, there, they just stuck it to the ratepayers. Now, in South Carolina, they began to build one, and they, after, I think, about $9 billion, somebody woke up and said, we're never going to get done. We have to, have to terminate the, the, uh, the project. But guess what? They had, the ratepayers have to pay for $9 billion. So there's a political crisis down there. Who's responsible? How did this happen? Merchant system's a little more of protection because someone can actually go bankrupt. And you have private investors taking some risk, and the regulators just overseeing it. So why did I go all through that? Market signals actually do matter, and if you're going to have all these different kinds of generators, there must be a market reason, not just some kind of favoritism reason. Well, the key reason why has to do with this. 
There's a difference between base load and peak load electrical supply. And peak loaders have different characteristics than base loaders. Now, what am I talking about? Base load electricity is the amount of electricity that you know will be demanded at a minimum 24-7, 365 in a year. So that's your base demand. Peak load has to do with that air dryer. Okay. Let's talk about that air dryer. When you are asleep at midnight, there's not a whole lot of demand beyond that base load for, I don't know, keeping the street lights on or whatever. But when you wake up, what do you do? You use your hair dryer, you turn the radio on, or the TV, or whatever. Then you go to work, and they turn on the lights, and maybe they even have some manufacturing electric motors to turn on. And then they might even, now this is winter, so you know there might be some electric heating. Most people have enough horse sense to heat with natural gas and electricity. Sometimes you're stuck doing electric things. Then what happens, this is the most important uh, event in uh, sort of the civilization of man and um, labor, uh, labor, uh, what would you call it, structure. It's called lunch. You familiar with this? You leave. There's, so some of the demand, you know, a few things are turned off. And then you come back, and you turn back things back on, and then, well, you go home. Yeah. These peaks in the winter are different than peaks in the summer. In the summer, basically, you wake up, and you start turning on the air conditioner, and you just keep, keep it on until you go home. Right? All of this peak load has to be supplied in a different fashion than this. Let's talk about what base load machines look like. They're big. That's the first thing. They're all big. Base load big. So coal plant, natural gas plant, hydro plant, nuclear plant. These things are measured in hundreds of megawatts of electricity, sometimes even in gigawatts. They're, did I mention they're big? Okay. Now, you don't just build enough capacity to supply your um, base load requirement. You have to build more than that. And the reason why is these things get dirty. You got to turn them off and clean them up. Uh, these get, I don't know, seaweed or I don't know, dead fish or whatever. You know, you, you got to clean that up. Filth, thank you. You can tell how much I know about that. Uh, natural gas even has to be, you know, these are, in many cases, jet engines. They have a service life. You have to service them. That's what the service are. And nuclear has to be refueled every, you know, 18 or so months. And you have to shut the thing down for several weeks. So while they're off, you have to bring something else on. So you have, you have to have more than what, you know, this figure might be. You may need, I don't know, some percentage more, or maybe twice as more, whatever. Uh, peak load generators are different in several respects. These are on at maybe 70 to 80 percent, in some cases 90 percent capacity as long as they're on. These are peak load generators. They use natural gas, diesel, propane, and the like. And they're kind of like, you're a car at a stop sign. You don't turn the engine off, although now some of the new cars, are, they do. But go with me here. It's a 1988 Honda that you own. <laughs> it's not the latest technology. And you, the car is on idle. They call that, have you ever heard of spinning reserve? Well, that's what it is. It's spinning around, waiting, idling, like you are at the stop sign. So it gets a signal. We need electricity to meet this peak demand now. So then you press on the accelerator. And you ramp up. And you dispatch. So they, they tend to be smaller, and boy, do you need a lot of these, a lot more than what you need to meet the actual number of whatever the peak load is. Why? Because, well, these things break down. Kind of like your 
car breaks down, you gotta service it. They're, they're kind of like engines, all right? So, um, the peak and the base load uh, get to another point, uh, and we'll talk about it, uh, and that is intermittency. I haven't portrayed renewables, which is you know, wind and solar, or talk about the storage systems yet, but the fact of the matter is you do not want more electricity than you want on that grid for the reasons that you'll see an out of balance and you'll blow it out. You obviously don't want less than what you need, but you also don't want more. And the problem with intermittent is they can generate a lot of electricity beyond what you might need even during peak load. And you have to either ignore it or manage it. Uh, these peak loaders are, are highly controlled you know, for that reason. All right. All right. So um, let's talk just a little bit about uh, the transmission systems for a moment to move that peak and base load. The United States, actually North America, and I think Europe, the way I would characterize them is that they're mature, complex, and international systems. They go into other countries. That's Canada, and that's Mexico. Um, this slide probably needs to be changed. It probably should just be electrical systems. That's my concern. We had an earlier brief. They're related, since we're going to see natural gas is becoming the dominant fuel for electricity in the country and in a lot of other places. It's growing in demand. But these systems uh, are complex. They allow you, when you have failures in a local area, to route around. It's robust. Um, you know, I, it, it may be that it needs lots of help because it's rickety and all that, but it isn't for a lack of wires laid out or systems you know, in place. Uh, there are you know, lots of substations. There are lots of transformers. There are lots of some direct current. There are different voltage levels for some lines. It's, it's very sophisticated. In Europe, um, yeah, this, this is the one that's going to turn. Remember? Or, or is it? Yeah, this has natural gas in it. We're not interested in it. Okay, we're it's just, just that. We got, no, no, this is the wrong set of slides. Right? No, there's, I remember at one point you had this, uh, and that was the only thing. We did it in the lecture notes. I, don't oh, know I see. Okay, yes, let's do it. Okay, we don't care about natural gas so much, right? Anyway, look at this. This is sophisticated international hooked up, all right? Now, when you get to other countries, this is not the case. Uh, Latin America does not uh, generally connect between countries. Uh, it is very basic, the grid. Uh, same in Africa, North Africa as well. And there are there is a genuine debate as to whether or not it makes sense to invest in making all of these connections for two reasons. First, it's really expensive. And some people say, you know, doing the grid that way is about as sensible as doing telephones using copper wire from the 50s and doing landlines. You just need to use cell signals. And what they're suggesting as an alternative Maybe we should just invest in local microgrids that don't actually connect to much. And it might be cheaper, and it might be quicker, and it might get electricity to places like in the middle there, <laughs> where, where there's nothing. Um, there's also another reason why this is not so easy to do in Latin America and North Africa in particular, and I think in Africa as well. You gotta have friends you got to have neighbors that want to have something break over their, their, their border. If you have a border dispute, or you don't get along with your neighbor, you're not going to rely on them giving you electricity or versa versa. So it requires a certain amount of political trust to connect. Uh, we're like, as acrimonious as our relations are with Canada and Mexico, they're not that bad. Um, so, now, when you get to the grids in um, Asia, uh, you also uh, find a certain level of uh, dysfunction. 
Uh, we've all probably seen this picture. How many of you have not ever seen this before? This is North and South Korea. Am I right? It's very popular. Look, they have lights and they don't. Well, it's worse than that. Um, the frequency of the transmission systems in the South are different than in the North. And a lot of people snicker and go, oh, well, that shows how backwards the North is, and you know, how superior the market, free market system of liberal democracy is. And by the way, I'm prepared to believe all of that. You know? I don't have any problem with that, but that's not probably a good way to look at it, because if you go to Japan, which last I checked is, you know, doing okay. I mean, they, they buy and drive pretty big cars, the last I checked. Um, they're safe in Japan. Dress well. They also have a problem. Uh, historically, the uh, eastern portion of the country is on, what is that, 50 uh, megahertz? Uh, hertz, 50 hertz, and this is 60. You can only move one gigawatt of electricity between north and south, or south, and, I mean, excuse me, east and west and west and east. That became a, it's become a big problem because most of the destruction of electrical systems from the 9-11 uh, crisis occurred up here. It would have been nice to get more than one gigawatt from down here. Couldn't do it. Uh, part of the reason this occurred was a historical accident popularization of certain kinds of appliances in you know, one place versus another. But the utility sensed that if they wanted to maintain monopoly power, it was in their interest not to network. This is not the most free market expression of electricity management. And this is still a problem. I mean, you know, one of the great things people were hoping for after 9-11 was breaking up the political influence and capital influence of the electrical utility so that you can have a more rational electrical system. Didn't happen yet. It might happen. Uh, in China, the problem is that you have most of your cities and most of your electrical demand and production along the coast, but if you want to get at the resources, both renewable and otherwise, they're over here. You need to build, and they are now attempting to build, um, high voltage direct current lines. Now, it's interesting. Mostly the narrative here is, oh, well, they're doing everything they can to get away from coal. We're spending you know, some on natural gas, but the big thing is nuclear. Well, a uh, couple of observations. Uh, I think it's about 3 or 4% of their electrical demand currently is supplied by nuclear. It will rise if they follow their plans, which are quite ambitious. Uh, meanwhile, what they're spending to do these grid improvements is a large multiple of what they're spending on nuclear energy. Maybe the way to look at this is the grid matters. It's not, it's, it's the transmission systems to the city. This is a big point that people have to master to understand what the future of electricity might be. Very it should be noted as well, none of these countries connect with any other country. There is a, a, a man who's the wealthiest, one of the wealthiest people in Japan, who's half Korean, half Japanese. Um, and he has a company called Bloom Energy, and they gave a brief, and they said, well, the way we should change things is just you know, connect everything with direct current. I said, how does that work? I mean, you'd have to assume people are going to wake up one day in Asia and forget that they hate one another. And they said, well, yeah, it, it could happen. You know, gradually it is. The younger people in these various countries don't hate one another as much as we hate one another. He said, but more important, the day someone recognizes that it's trivial to connect Korea to southern Japan, and it is, and the TEPCO has suggested this, they're going to make ton of money. And as soon as they do that, everyone else is going to want to do it. we got to be ready for that. So, maybe this is the future. Okay. I have a quick question. Yeah. Why are we sometimes seeing this divergence between in the 
developed countries do super massive surge, and in developing countries, kind of the distributed. Well, again, I think I tried to highlight it. Um, it's kind of the same reason why we did landline and developing countries skipped it. It's because landlines are super expensive and arguably unnecessary. Therefore, take the money and run. Why then are we doubling down on these mass trips? Well, I'll get to that in a moment, but um, it's kind of like, well, first of all, you have the capital invested in it, and it's there. So the marginal costs of improving it might make more sense than you know, recreating everything. Um, the more vulgar reason, I think, is uh, which state? I'm from Kentucky. Anybody live in that state? <laughs> Maryland. Maryland. That's, now, that's a nice corrupt state. Uh, Delaware. Anybody live in Delaware? Yeah? Yeah. Well, they all sleep with one another. It's called legislation. The purpose of local <laughs> government. <laughs> The purpose of local government is to be interested in local money. And you just to know you're up, you have half an hour left and you're outside for just now. Understood. <laughs> <laughs> it's just called free ranging here. The um, but you did your job by reminding me. Thank you. It was gonna happen. Believe it or not, it, it gets easier. What do you, why do you uh, run for local office? It's because half the time you're interested in making some money or making some connections, or you have them already. So when they say all politics is local, the other way to put it is there's a certain amount of familiarity with corruption associated with local politics. The electrical systems in our country are regulated by states, right? and state utilities do not want to spend any more money to make money. They would like to get as much capital out of the capital they've invested. So a lot of utilities, for example, resist, please do things differently because, well, wait a minute, I want you to keep buying what I got. I mean, it, it took a while for people to get off whale oil for the same reason, you know, in 1870. Not a, not a great answer, but does, does any of that sound reasonable to you? Yeah. I think the more dignified answer is you can make the grid work a lot better, and the marginal investments in that may make more sense than going to microgrid. I'm of the view you want to experiment and do all of that, and try to listen to market signals to figure out what makes more sense, and try to keep the amount of uh, corruption down to a mild roar, limit the rate. Okay. Um, now. We're on slide 16, you say. Yeah. 17. Nobody said I wasn't making progress. Okay. All right. I just want to see where I am in my notes, just generally. Okay. Here we go. Right. Okay. Now, with the, with, with the basics of electrical system sort of now, uh, we can get into the more the finer points that, that, that they go on. First of all, what are the trends, uh, nuclear and non-nuclear? One of them, both here and abroad, is that you're substituting natural gas for coal. Part of the reason you're doing this, well, a number of reasons. First of all, we started uh, about in the 90s looking for natural gas instead of just waiting for it to arise whenever we sniffed around for oil. And when we started looking for natural gas, by itself, we found a lot. Then there was a fracking revolution, which allowed us to extract natural gas from places we didn't basically bother with. Not only that, but that revolution was kind of like Moore's Law. The various permutations of that technology allowed you to do more extraction for less and with fewer people. And it's it's been kind of doubling every few years as to how much you can extract, or, or more. i give you one example. Uh, it used to be that they would do horizontal drilling and <coughs> run one line. Now they run 10. Cost pretty much the same, except you get, well, hell, a heck of a lot more natural gas. 
and the number of people you need to do that actually is going down. So it's, it's a highly leveraged set of, of, of revelation. The jet engine industry, the gas turbine industry, gets better and better and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, we've been tapping that comparative advantage. And people have discovered that if you really work at it, you sleeve properly, and they're not, and you store properly, well, and they're not, you could actually eliminate most of the methane waste within a tolerable amount of time. And if you did, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from burning natural gas is significantly less than coal, something like 50 to 60 percent less. Well, that's a lot of reasons for this to happen. Okay, this is America on coal. Oh my, it's gone down. This is America on natural gas. Oh my, it's now more than coal. I think these are renewables. Yeah, wind and solar make them more so much. But this is a big deal. Well, we have a lot of it. Uh, and we keep finding more of it, even in the United States. If it was just us, that would be significant. I mean, we're one of the world's largest natural gas producers now. Didn't used to be. We used to have depots down here to import stuff. You hadn't heard of them. Same over here. I don't know what we're doing on the West Coast, uh, but there are some export uh, depots, I'm sure, that are being developed. Um, prices. Well, you know, they do come up, but basically we're now, I think it's $3.88 per million BTU. It's been as low as beneath $2, but it's, it's not looking like a bull market. This, this, this is more likely to stay this way for quite a while. Because, as I mentioned, we are finding lots of reserves. This is China, by the way. These reserves have different extraction prices. I don't want you to think, oh, well, geez, look at that big blob. Oh, wow, they've got plenty. Well, maybe, but it's expensive as hell. Chinese are working there. Uh, here's another uh, set of discoveries that are our president would say is huge. Yeah. Uh, Egypt, Israel, uh, I don't know what Lebanon's up to, but Cyprus, all these places now are trying to figure out not how to import, but how to export natural gas. These are enormous problems for this. Um, it's one of the reasons why building a nuclear power plant in Egypt you know, should kind of raise your eyebrow a little. Wait a minute. Uh, why don't you just use some of that natural gas? Now you get all forms of argumentation, but I'm just saying it's kind of interesting. Oh, now <laughs> they're lousy lately. Lots of reserves. Uh, Iran, even worse. This is how much natural gas is used to power electricity. Where's the nuclear guy on? It's barely visible. <laughs> and of course, as as an Iranian that I met at some Geneva conference told me, he said, I said, do you really need nuclear power? He says, of course not. Um, but of course, we leave our windows open and we get it for free. And so under those circumstances, of course we will. But if we didn't, you know, of course we wouldn't and don't. Not very efficient in many of these countries, the way they, they use the energy. But then everybody will find out has room for improvement there. Okay, here's a nice set of charts that shows you the retirements of coal. Now, uh, these are re the coal retirements through 2016. It, it just gets worse over time in the future. And these are the natural gas openings, uh, plant openings that measure the megawatts. It's quite robust. Now, you know, just a political comment. Um, a lot of rural electric bought into coal being cleaned up a little to take care of not so much the carbon, but sulfur, mercury, or whatever, arsenic. Having made those investments, they were a little annoyed when they were told, oh, you should shut those down, they're not clean. 
some of the enthusiasm for maintaining looser standards for coal burning comes from the electoral map <laughs> and those folks. And I'm not sure uh, that's wrong. I mean, I think the, uh, what is it, uh, the founder said, interest should have a voice. Well, that's part of what that's about. Um, however, all things being equal, utilities are not investing. Oh, even the Chinese. Now, I don't know how seriously to take this, but the rhetorical, I always say, hypocrisy is the price life pays for virtue. It's a start. Uh, I don't think uh, they're moving anywhere near as quickly as they should, and they're still opening up new coal plants, but they want to move away from words on nuclear itself. The first thing uh, you might want to talk about in trying to understand the economics of nuclear is go to its selling point now. Um, the selling point, which is, it comes come at an odd time. I mean, I, I think we're now uh, have an executive branch that's not entirely seized with the, uh, the concern with global uh, carbon emission. Uh, last I checked, it's, there's at least rhetorical differences uh, with them versus Obama or, or the previous administration. That said, the nuclear industry meanwhile is doubling down on the argument that, well, ours is a zero or very close to zero emission energy zone. Now, uh, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons we'll get into, um, People don't think about numbers when, when they hear that. Uh, as I say in Washington, infinite, infinity and zero are the two political numbers. So zero emissions, and people get excited, and they'll pay infinite amount of money for whatever zero is. You know? um, you, you're interested in the integers in, in between. And this is uh, a brief that was given by a man who was, at the time, running uh, the largest merchant. You remember that merchant uh, utility? Uh, the, I should say the largest nuclear merchant utility in the world, Exelon. And this is John Rowe. It was several days, I think it was a day or two before the Fukushima accident. So it's an interesting brief. And what he said is, you know, I am a nuclear engineer. I love nuclear power plants. I like to build them. I just can't do it. Uh, my my uh, you know, investors, uh, I would be not doing the right thing. Maybe we can do this in one or two decades. And when people said, well, why, he threw up this chart. Now, this is a chart generated uh, as a result of a model. Uh, does anybody know what the McKinsey company is? If you're lucky and you want to make tons of money, you'll work there. It's like Pete Marwick or, I don't know, uh, Price Waterhouse or, I don't know, what, I don't know what the latest. Uh, it's a big accounting firm. And they produced a model called the McKinsey Greenhouse Gas Cost Abatement Curve. I can't believe I can remember that. And what it does is it tunes you into what's called the time value of money. Now, let me give you two opportunities to reduce carbon. I'm assuming for the moment I've got Birkenstocks on. I'm all in. I want to reduce carbon. Okay? <laughs> if that's the case, let's get on the train and think about what the economics might be. Let me give you two examples. I want you to think about this. There's a certain amount of carbon we want to eliminate, carbon emissions, and we can do it. One way to do it would be to build two large natural gas base load electrical generators. What are the numbers here? Uh, yeah, wrote this little thing down. And uh, hang on, these notes are useful for something. Yeah, here we go. Uh, right. Okay, so you can build that those two plants. It take you 24 months to build it. 
two billion dollars. You can get a return on investment in a few short years. Or, option two, you could roughly eliminate the same amount of carbon by building, uh, by retiring the same number of coal plants and building in, in their place one single large nuclear power plant will cost you not two billion, but 13 billion, and will take maybe 13 years to complete. And you can secure your return on investment in, oh, I don't know, a few decades. Which do you choose? One. Say again? Option one. No kidding. When someone comes to you and says, you know, I think I know how to perfect fusion. And I, all I want is several trillion dollars in a hundred years. Or somebody comes to you with a natural gas option, you might want to think first about the natural gas option. Maybe you do research and development on the other stuff, but you don't buy the build. This chart captures those kinds of trade-offs. And if you look carefully at this chart, and John Rowe pointed it out, here's where I believe nuclear begins. Uh, new, is that new nuclear? Uh, Hard getting good help here. I am so sorry. Of course, I didn't even pin this here. Okay. It's this thing, isn't it? New nuclear plant. It is. Clean coal, white, clean coal. It's this. The big fat. That's number 16. What do you do before then? Well, you turn off the coal plant. You substitute natural gas. The first thing you do, which is something I, I'm constantly asking my wife to do, is you turn off the lights. She's from Australia, and they don't do it. They got cheap electricity. At least they used to. You just give people more incentives to turn off the lights and use, you know, different kinds of lights and little switches that automatically turn off the lights. And pretty soon, and maybe you use ceiling fans instead of air conditioning all the time. Believe me, I, I when I before I got married, I spent four times more on my electricity than afterwards because she doesn't like air conditioning, so we have the ceiling fan. I learned, you know. It's actually more comfortable. It's not as noisy. We changed out all the lights because, well, they burned out. Might as well buy better ones. Put switches on that turn things off. It was dramatic. Also, it helps that I don't live there as much. You know, so <laughs> turn everything off. The point is, you make money encouraging people to use less. And doing some of these conversions, you can get a return on investment and make a profit pretty quickly. That would be your market signal. So if you're into killing carbon, it isn't that the market's your enemy, in my book. It actually could be your friend if you bothered to listen to it. Do we? Well, could listen a little better. Number 16, new, new builds. OK, he then said, well, this could change. And by the way, it can. And I think we need to be sensitive to this. If you put a big price on carbon and natural gas, the alternative of choice, got more and more expensive, well, that would be different. But he said in 2011, the price would have to be in the case of, God, we're going to have to put some better um, monikers on this. I mean, I don't even know what this chart is. I assume this is the price. The price would have to be $9 per million BTU. And now it's you know somewhere between 2 and $4. And it's been there for quite a while. The number of times it's been above nine is like for a few months over the past, I don't know, a few decades. Um, you might want to get uh, also uh, the price of carbon to come up. Now, this is more interesting. The, we don't have a, a carbon market, but the EU does. And for the longest time, it was failing. Uh, they now have put into place all sorts of regulations such that the price of carbon now, I believe, is um, what is it, 21 or 20, 
Here it is. Uh, well, he said that the carbon price would have to be above twenty-eight dollars per per metric ton of carbon. You'd have to tax it at that rate. Well, right now in Europe, it's uh, it's risen to twenty-three, and it will go higher. All that suggests well, nuclear may come back. All we need to do is I don't know, run out of natural gas. Big problem though. What has gone up since twenty eleven? Oh, the capital costs and the life cycle costs of the nuclear power plant. It's roughly doubled. Oops. You need it to go in the other direction, not double, but have. It's not going in that direction. Here are some uh, cost estimates. We're going to go through just a little bit here. I got 15 minutes. We need to get done here. We'll see. Um, first, does anybody know what our overnight cost estimate is? It's kind of a cute trick. It is of some use. I mean, there's a reason they come up with these. If you have a really large capital cost project, like a big dam or a nuclear power plant, and it costs billions of dollars and takes years, you might want to make the sale on the point that if you could build it overnight, it would cost X. That doesn't look so bad. Uh, if it costs, uh, let's say, a certain number of billions to do it overnight, what happens if you build it over 10 years? Does it stay at, let's say, a few billion? It goes up. Um, imagine that you uh, have to actually take a loan out. What happens when you take a loan out? You've got to start paying it right away. If it takes you 13 years to build a nuclear power plant, your, your overnight costs are much less than your startup costs, because those carrying costs for 13 years are well, again, huge. But what's interesting is if you take a look at the overnight costs, which should favor you know, the estimates and make them look not so bad, and you track how those overnight costs are going, uh, they're going the wrong direction. They're going up. Here, this is, this is uh, you know, uh, these overnight costs uh, are for some of the latest reactors I mentioned in South Carolina and Georgia. Um, wrong direction. Wrong direction. Um, the the uh, rule of thumb generally is as follows, that you're supposed to have uh, what's called a learning curve. Have you heard of that? Oh, well, we're going to have a learning curve. The price is going to come down. If we just need to build more. Well, how does this work? Well, there are various rules of thumb. Some go one way or the other, but let me give you two extreme ones. One says that the cost per plant should fall by 50% after 10 similar plants are built. Uh, or the cost should decline 3 to 10% for every doubling of the number of plants built. That isn't what's happening here, folks. <laughs> it's, it, it should be going down by now. It's not. And then the argument is, oh, well, each plant's different. Really? OK, you know, but how much do you want to play this game? So what's driving that? A lot of things. I mean, besides time overruns. Well, no, no, I mean, but you're asking why are there time overruns. A uh, couple of things. First, the, the business model for the big utilities is to always have a new product every 10 years and to get the government to pay for the design of it. They call that R&D, even though it's not really R&D. It's design work. But you get the public to pay for that. Then you deploy it. But every time you do a new product, you run into teething problems. So that's part of it. Then if the demand for the product is going down because the price is going up, guess what happens? You don't build so many. And when you don't build so many, you don't have so many people to build it. Then you have a scarcity of people to build. There was a piece yesterday, 750 Canadians had to be hired to complete uh, some electrical work at the Vocal plant because, well, they couldn't find any Americans. Keep in mind, I, I can't resist saying this, the selling point on completing this was, well, there'll be more American jobs. It's hard finding people who are qualified. 
you, you know, nuclear power isn't another way to boil water. You have to be particularly careful that you don't have a radiological leak. So, you, you know, how you pour that concrete, how you do the rebar, how you do the wiring, how you do the piping, never mind the nuclear island, is much more quality assurance uh, driven than any other kind of power plant. And you have to be certified. Now, you could say, oh, well, we should get rid of the certifications. And my rejoinder is, OK, let's get rid of the insurance. Let's get rid of the regulations, see how we go. Might be a fun experiment. You know, that might take care of things. You, know, you, get, you get something cheap and quick, but you know, do you feel comfortable? The nuclear industry, to their credit, doesn't want that. They want the regulations to give the patina and the coverage, saying it's safe. You know? So there's a struggle here. Um, does that help? OK, uh, here's some levelized costs. That's for an AP1000. Uh, this was before Fukushima. After Fukushima, the, the, the numbers went up because they had to be refits for various things. Uh, and, and the NRC did not go all in in demanding a lot of changes because they did not want to kill the thing they're regulating. But even still, the pricing for, and costs have gone up because of Fukushima. Here is a not so good story. Uh, the profitability outlook for nuclear power plants, um, you can see there's an awful lot in this column versus this column. Part of the problem there is doing the safety uh, refits and operating these things and competing against natural gas uh, is really difficult. So in the merchant areas, this is a hard sell. And it, it can be cheaper to shut them down. This was not expected even by the critics of nuclear power, by the way. So nuclear growth in the US is likely to be negative. Uh, here are the power plants in 2018, planned shutdowns. According to you know, an anti-nuke operation, they claim that one third of the plants uh, might shut down in the next, I guess, decade. I, I forget the time frame. But the trend is going in this direction. This is the reason why the Secretary of Energy and the uh, White House want to do special bailouts to keep nuclear power going because the economics are so bad. The utilities that own them are saying we want to shut them down. OK, if it was just the United States, I think it's interesting because we're the largest nuclear uh, power uh, country in the world by a, still a significant margin. But it's happening in Europe. The numbers are going down, and they will go down more dramatically. Uh, what is this? This is the startups in Europe. You can see they're not, <laughs> the shutdowns are in red. Um, this is not, you know, a gung-ho market. It's, it's a negative market. In Japan, they had arguably, you know, high 40s, maybe some people say 50 plants. They've got nine online. Uh, that does not appear to be likely to change dramatically. It may go up to maybe double that number, but we're not getting back to 50. They're, not, they're just not doing nuclear in any robust way in Japan from here on out. Uh, let's see here. Oh, in South Korea, they're coming down. Now, if that is President Moon. It could be reversed a little, but my hunch is after five or six years of not building, it will not be that easy to ramp up quickly. It will take a lot of time. And if there is another, I understand that Korean political uh, parties tend to stay in power two terms, even if the president only lasts one. Now, if that's the case, it will be very difficult not to, to reverse this move in Korea to move away from nuclear. In Taiwan, they're unplugging all five gigs. Uh, even in China, uh, the targets are being missed. This target was reduced. It, it used to be you know, somewhere around here. It came down. They're not going to meet it. Uh, this comes from a, from a very pro-nuke uh, operation and projection. But an economist who I, who I know and I actually have contract and I respect, uh, and uh, Steve Kidd, and he lays out the reasons why this is a more realistic number for 2030, and maybe even that won't be achieved. Again, they have a problem finding qualified labor. And they dare not, in China, have an accident because the, the government will be written all over it. In other words, that will be something that will 
like a Chernobyl, uh, will be an indictment against the regime. And they know this. And we've had conversations. I've talked with them about it. Others have as well. So at some level, they want to you know, get ahead and be quick. But they also know there are political liabilities for accidents. Oh, I told them, I said, in the United States, what we do in an accident is we sue one another for 30 years. And then there, nobody gets any money. It's bleak house. You know, the lawyers take all the money. As in Japan, they, you know, they get up and apologize, and then they bail them out. They become economic zombies. China does not have any of those options if there's an accident. It could be that the legitimacy of the regime will take a hit, and they are very nervous about that. OK. The nuclear economics in the Middle East, we're hearing a lot about this because Saudi Arabia. OK. Uh, where are we? 11 cents, I think. There we are. Now, I think the, this is transmission and distribution investments you have to make to make it work. But roughly, you're at about uh, 11 cents. Uh, the concentrated solar is, you know, uh, where is concentrated solar? Concentrated solar PV is, you know, it's a fraction of that. Concentrated solar is at 7 point or 8 cents. This is at 11. Some of these other things are peak peak power plants, so you know, they are always going to be much more expensive. Um, but that is not, th these are figures done by analysts in the region, not Americans. Uh, these, are, these are by people who live there. Um, this is not the most promising way to go, uh, I think, if you're looking to make electricity in the Middle East. And part of the reason why has to do with these developments. Uh, you asked about the grid. You can make a grid dispatch, pick up intermittent, hold more electricity, release it, and not uh, have failure if you make it smarter by switching and making it bigger and bigger. You know, a, a, one way to solve a problem is make it much bigger and distribute the risk by making the grid so large that you can store, in a sense, a lot of electricity on that larger grid. But you have to be able to do a lot of switching. Does that make sense? What would you use? Well, you would have supercapacitors, things that could store a fair amount of electricity and boom, switch it out. Uh, you would have uh, battery parks, you know, lithium ion batteries, maybe flow batteries. Uh, maybe you'd use concentrated solar as a battery at night. You just heat things up, and you keep that heat on storage, and you produce electricity with that heat at night. That's a kind of battery. Maybe you do pump storage with water. Very expensive, but you can do it in certain geographic situations where it's economic, blah, blah, blah. Smart monitors, these things are in your basement, if you last checked, already. Uh, and you use direct high-voltage current systems to move large amounts of surplus much further in distance so that it, you can get to a market that will suck it up. Uh, now, when you do that, um, the grid can get smart. Uh, it will then allow you to move from centrally generated electricity uh, over a centralized grid to the consumer to something where um, you have lots of things going into the consumer some of it not on the grid. Cogeneration, a lot of big companies do their own solar roofs. A lot of them will even have windmills. And they will use the grid when they have to. So in, in an ideal world of this sort, where you have lots of not just smart grid, but a lot of off-grid stuff, the grid becomes an insurance policy, a secondary system, rather than a primary system. Right now, most of your electricity, almost all of it comes off the grid. And in fact, you use microsystems to push more electricity on the grid. You could go in a different direction, where you have the microgrids not connect to the grid. And when they fail, you still have a grid to supply electricity for those, those occasions when it's not uh, your, your microgrid isn't working. We're in the midst of the middle of this opera. Uh, we are roughly, uh, here's, here's smart 
technology investment. You notice China is knocking itself out. This is even before Fukushima. The United States is you know, working as best it can. Uh, here's another uh, thing that you need to know about smart grids and intermittents. This is a California uh, independent system operator chart for what's called the duck curve. And the duck curve uh, is, is really what's called a net load curve. This is a day from 12 AM to, well, I guess midnight. Uh, and this is what, what these various, this, these are years. They, they're projecting what the grid will do. And what they're saying is these lines consist of the demand after you throw the intermittent solar and wind into the system. You subtract that power out. What does what your demand look like? Well, in 2012, uh, the intermittents really didn't do much to change demand. But by 2020, you're going to see so much solar and so much wind, it'll supply almost all of the demand. Do you see that? That's what that's about. But when the sun sets, around 6 or thereabouts, there's still a lot of demand, but there's not much supply. And so in this case, by 2020, you're going to be turning off all your baseload generators if you want to have this intermittent stuff taking, because it's cheaper. You know, it's almost free or very cheap. But then you have to turn off the baseload generator. And then at the end of the day, oh my god, you got to ramp up everything. And it gets super expensive. This is not good. You do not like this curve. I mean, you can tolerate a curve that's kind of like that, i.e. almost no curve. You've got to flatten this thing out. How do you do that? Storage. And these things are not so cheap. This is, of course, our friend uh, Mr. Musk. But the fact of the matter is it helps. The question is, are we going to be able to make batteries really cheap that can be take on a lot of uh, storage and, and do the job repeatedly over a long cycle life. Um, we're seeing some games being played that are really interesting and unanticipated. A natural gas plant uh, that's a peaker can be turned off now. What it does is it runs, it stores up the batteries. It sits and waits for the dispatch call. It dispatches what's in the battery and then uses the time to start this thing up over 30 minutes. These batteries need only work 30 minutes. But guess what? You've just made this natural gas plant super clean, even cleaner than normal, making it tougher to get rid of the natural gas game. So I mean, they're, they're, we don't even know how all of this technology will play out. OK, uh, renewables I've talked about. Um, I just wanted to see where, where, where? This is the wrong. Last night, we put together the concentrated solar yeah. slides. This is the wrong right. brief. Okay. I've convinced myself it's wrong. Have I convinced you? Yeah, no, you're right. OK. Sorry. All right. There was a different brief. It was great. <laughs> this one's great, <laughs> but it could be greater. Um, what, what's happening there, I've already described. Actually, I think what happened, Amaya, is we do have the slides. You know where they are? We just, we just put them. Uh, you just put them too early? Well, I don't think we put them too early. I'm, I'm, you know, increasingly, I think I'm just grumpy. I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't think you should listen to me quite so much. Where, where, where do they go, though? Didn't we see them before? I don't think so. Well, wait a minute. They should have been here. Oh, well. You know what? They're not. In other words, they should have gone in. And I, I, there is a problem with the briefing charts. You've got too many, and you're not disciplining them. We've got to, you know, got to get the right ones and get rid of the wrong ones. And what we're doing is just throwing stuff in, checking the box. It's killing me. Okay. All right. Let's close this thing out. Um, as I mentioned, I don't think we know if our cars will, by the, another storage option, uh, use batteries from cars. I mean, if you get enough electric cars, you could have the house plug into the car instead of the car plug into the house. What I mean by that is if you have enough cars with batteries, the grid can top them off, either in parking lots or in your home. And then you can have those things available, not just for transport, but to supply the house with electricity 
during certain periods of night. Okay? Uh, that depends on how many electric vehicles penetrate the fleet. You know, that's a big debate. I mean, there are arguments for and against that. I'm a gas, natural, I'm a, I'm a regular gasoline guy, so, you know, I, I, I could go either way on this. But, you know, certainly, if there are a lot of electric vehicles, that's one way to go. Um, the argument, of course, is that as there are more people and more people get uh, more of a taste for electricity, we're going to need more electricity. I cannot argue against that. However, I think people need to keep in mind that just as we don't know what storage, distribution, uh, transmission, and consumption technologies and demands and supplies will be like, we probably don't know exactly what the demand will be for electricity either. It's not simply linear. And the reason why is the advanced economies actually are now producing more GDP with less electrical uh, energy. Uh, and in this case, it looks like any kind of energy. Um, so, you know, we're not clear on how that works. In addition, um, well, this is the consumption per capita into, I don't know, uh, various countries. It's kind of an interesting, you know, Rorschach. But it, it certainly is going down, and I don't see that changing. Uh, there, the efficiencies of certain economies, German and Japanese, are like eye-wateringly ahead of us by, you know, factor of two or three. And they want to push it even further. I think they're the future, not the anomaly. Uh, in addition, uh, I didn't mention it, but uh, the models for all sorts of disasters uh, associated with global warming are driven not just a little bit by population. Uh, well, how does that work? If you listen to some demographers, it's, you know, we're going this way. Uh, I tend to think it's very unclear. It probably may be that population will peak a lot sooner. Uh, and there certainly is an argument. I, I obviously don't know. Uh, but it has an awful lot to do with uh, the educational level of women. Fertility rates go down. The educational level of women, however, generally, except in Africa, is going way up. The fertility rates are going down. And so I don't know that the Malthusian chart of you know, population growth is a complete thought. It doesn't seem to me we know exactly how these things will play out. Uh, with regard to nuclear power, uh, they will have to reinvent. Even, I believe, the Nuclear Energy Institute and the proponents of nuclear power have pretty much said the big plants have had their day. We have to reinvent and make the small plants work. I'll leave on this note. Originally, plants were small, and they were consciously made small so that they could be made quickly and within cost. They went to larger plants in the 60s through the 70s because they wanted economy of scale, and they wanted to drive the price down further. There was a bit of a debate in the Atomic Energy Commission at the time. Well, do we want to take the risks? Well, you know, industry won out, and they went large. We're now saying, oh, well, that didn't work as well as we wanted to. So let's abandon economies of scale and go small and hope that we can make so many of these things, we can drive the capital cost per unit way down. Jury's out. I'm skeptical, you can tell. But that's what has to happen. The manpower has to also go down, so the life cycle costs go down. I think there is a problem with insurance. Uh, it's been estimated that the levelized cost for nuclear power is around, you know, optimistically 10 cents per, per, per uh, kilowatt hour. Um, some people estimate that the subsidy associated with capping the insurance is worth a multiple of that. Now, you know, I don't know if that's true, but if it is, it tells you that some of the real costs of these things are hidden. I think that's true with every energy type. Uh, but I have a special interest in the nuclear stuff because, as I've stated before, and I'll end on this phrase, they're not just another way to boil water. 
They also can serve as bomb starter kits. So unless there is a clear economic imperative to build them, I can think of some security imperatives to be very, very cautious. 